Hello and uh, welcome to the Austin Software Cooperatives Meetup Group. We are reviewing design justice, community-led practices to build the worlds we need by Sasha Costanza Chalk. We're reviewing chapters one and two. Uh, the book uh, we felt uh, deserved more than one uh, review. So the main question in chapter one is what values do we encode and reproduce in the objects and systems that we design? So this chapter is all about design values. So one of the, the <clears throat> overarching themes of the chapter is that um, values are oftentimes um, implicitly or unknowingly uh, pushed into the objects that we design. And um, to, I guess to go back some, design applies to software it applies to um, you know civil engineering it applies to even the um, business entities that we create so it applies to you know it really permeates almost everything we do so uh, the book is really trying to tease out and make explicit the decisions that we make. <clears throat> and then there, is, there are some positions that are taken where uh, that there are, can be injustice that occurs within the design process and we should avoid it. This first chapter talks about some of, there's some nomenclature about design itself. Uh, one of them is uh, an affordance. So an affordance is an object's properties that show the possible actions a user can take with it, thereby suggesting how they may interact with that object. For instance, a button can look as it needs to be turned or pushed. So affordance is, are one of the things that are designed and the decisions that you make can weigh heavily on what it is that your internal values are. And really, I would say what it is that you're optimizing. So you can optimize towards um, things that are kind of self-beneficial or maybe optimizing towards whatever it is that you're used to, the dominant narrative or worldview you have. And uh, the author calls this uh, reproducing the values um, that you already hold and, and maybe doing it implicitly instead of explicitly. So <clears throat> there's a position here off the takes. Uh, most designers today do not intend to 
systematically exclude marginalized groups of people. However, power inequalities are instantiated in the affordances and disaffordances of socio-technical systems may be intentional or unintentional. Consequences may be relatively small or they may, they may be relatively quite significant. So the process of design justice, we may say uh, more specifically that under neoliberal multicultural capitalism, most of the time designers unintentionally reproduce the matrix of domination, which is white supremacy, hetero patriarchy, capitalism, and settle, settler colonialism, among other things. The author makes a point that design justice is not about intentionality, it's about process and outcome. Design justice asks whether the affordances of a design object or system disproportionately reduce opportunities for already oppressed groups of people while enhancing life opportunities of dominant groups independently of whether designers intend this outcome so <clears throat> one of the positions that the book takes uh one of the okay, one of the problems with trying to and she talks about it later but what is it that how do you make the decision on who you're going to design for. How do you whittle that down? One of the reoccurring themes I've seen in the book is that there, um, what you can do is look at historically marginalized groups and dominant groups, and then that's where you should start. So that answers the question of where the justice should be applied or where it comes from or what should be prioritized. And then conversely, when you ignore that, whether intentionally or unintentionally, then there is injustice that's occurring. So um, making those decisions explicit is the, the thrust of the of the argument for the book as a push towards justice. So any questions so far or comments? Okay, and move on. Bigger. All right. So there's a concept, there's different types of design, universal design has gained reach and impact over the last three decades. Universal design emphasizes that objects, places, and systems we design must be accessible with, to the widest possible set of potential users. This is kind of the intuition someone might have when thinking of what, what is the way that we ought to design. Then, um, a critique of that would be you need to make, um, you're going to have implicit decisions that you make, and you should make those explicit. And you, you think you're going to do universal, but you're probably going to fail, and then you should also make that explicit. Um, but maybe you shouldn't even try. So there's a different kind of design um, that's not universalizing the inclusive design research center style. And it defines inclusive design as follows, a design that considers the full range of human diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, gender, age, and other forms of human difference. The approach to design recognizes human diversity and respects the uniqueness of every individual and acknowledges that a given individual might, in, might experience different interactions with the same design interface or object, depending on the context. And they also see disability as a socially constructed and relational 
rather than a binary property, so disabled or not, and it adheres to the individual. So, uh, in other words, uh, the one size fits all is not the way to go. Um, one size fits one is what they rather you uh, think about. At the same time, they, they acknowledge segregated solutions that are technically and economically un, uh, set, well, they acknowledge that segregated solutions are techni te technically and economically unsustainable. Uh, in the digital domain, active design it enables personalization and flexible configuration and shares core object values, tools, platforms. So this is kind of a pushback on the universal style <clears throat> and saying that if you start taking um, consideration of probably your users or who is going to be affected by the design and and uh, probably getting ahead of ourselves, you include them in on the de uh, design process, you're going to start seeing the design conform to certain attributes. So um, we, it's pro being sensitive to that is probably the way to go is what the author is thinking. Uh, there's some critiques on some of the titans of design. So Steve Krug's book, Don't Make Me Think, is very popular. Like I said, the Bible of interface design. And it's pushing the universal style. Um, and I think this is an important statement. Is it always or ever? possible to reduce co the cognitive load for all users simultaneously? Perhaps not. Instead, designers constantly make choices about which users to privilege and which ones have to do more work. UI decisions distribute higher and lower cognitive loads among different kinds of people. Now this point, I think, is really the concession of the book. The point is not that it's wrong to privilege some users over others. The point is that these decisions need to be made explicit. So I'd like to stop here and see what people think of this point or anything else that people would like to comment on uh, so far. I think uh go ahead Jeff. So yeah, I mean I have I've actually taken some notes I'll paste into the chat at the end of the presentation but um th this you know I'm I'm very interested in I, I actually handed out this book to the English teacher at the school where I work because I'm a computer science teacher and I noticed that all the interesting discussions don't take place in our STEM classes. They take place in the humanities classes. Yet, in the humanities classes where they're discussing all the big issues about what kind of world we're going to live in, they don't grasp this, the technology. And as this book points out, we're now living in a socio-technical world. And the technology is so important. So. What was so important to me is how we bridge that gap. Yeah, you know, I think we, that is really important. Other people. Yeah. So, do you find that this point here is? Um, so, let me reiterate. The point is not that it's wrong to privilege some users over others. The point is that these decisions need to be made explicit. Do you, what do you think about that? Do you think that that's a, a concession? Do you think that that is uh, like a strong stance on justice? Or like what, well, the, what do you think about that? Well, in the context of the rest of her book, she is definitely, you know, has an egalitarian streak. And it's not like the, the claim is that 
we, we should we should uh, validate privilege. It's that it's okay when you're designing something to have some particular group in mind that you're serving, you know, whose needs you may be serving, but you should be explicit mm -hmm. so that you can then in the context of a democratic society where we're going to be aware of the matrix of domination and then we're going to be able to place whatever we're doing within that context, we can make good dis decisions. Yeah, I find it uh, interesting that there's a, like the phrase matrix of domination, it seems implied that conforming to the matrix of domination is wrong. It's what it seems like they're implying here over and over, really. But right, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, ooh, there's other people that want to say something. So let's go. Who else yeah. Is... yeah, I'm talking too much. Go ahead, Carlos. Hi, it's Carlos. Uh, my name is Carlos Reynoso. Can you guys hear me? Hey. Hey. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hear you. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Um, I think uh, what comes to mind to me is uh, that uh, I guess people, I mean, organizations may usually have like some kind of restriction in terms of like their resources and time. I think it seems kind of reasonable at, that at certain time they need to make a decision as to how to direct their time. And uh, resources, um, I think that the explicit part kind of leads to understanding why it is that you're focusing on certain people and um, why they may be excluded at a certain time or put off. I think it's that. I think that's that. That's that point is to reflect on as to why it's being done. Is it for money? Is it for um uh you know maybe they're just not the focus group of like the purpose of whatever kind of system you're building and so um i think that's the part that i found interesting at least for that uh that section the red the red part there yeah you raised the, the point at some point the rubber meets the road and you have to make a decision and uh you know we don't have unlimited resources so at that point you go you make a decision he's saying oh, go ahead and make it explicit um i mean everybody here if you've been part of a design process it i think something to add into that is it seems like the easy way out Every, Everybody says that our resources are limited, and now we've got to now we've got to concentrate on whoever's using this or whoever has the most money or all of these things or you know I think that make it implicit part i'm sorry make it explicit uh, it seems that somehow is the the thrust of the justice portion like we're being just because we made it explicit but i don't that's as much as i i think it's a strong stance but uh i'd like to see i'd like to see some other viewpoints but go ahead jeffrey i think you oops so um it it you know i was I, in the notes i keep i end up keep coming back to that famous quote from che Guevara that true revolutionaries are motivated by great feelings of love and in the and in this book um you, in the around this topic she tells a pretty touching story that i think illustrates it about the loft and i'm gonna i'm probably gonna mangle it a bit but the basic idea that i took away from it is like you imagine you built you got this cabin and you're building this loft well only the children can benefit from the loft. They have to climb a ladder to get up into it. It's kind of small. And you may have grandma in a wheelchair or something who can't. So this is being designed for the children, not for grandma in the wheelchair. But 
that's okay. Grandma will enjoy watching the children climb the ladder to get into the loft. And, and you know, it, it, you have to look at the context. You have to be explicit. You, you, you can't always have every, every, we're not, you know, we're, we're different in different places in our lives, different needs and all of that. So it's not like any design decision will always be able to serve everyone. It won't, but it should be just. Mm. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. It's all good comments. <clears throat> so, controversy. Algorithms are used as decision making tools by power holders in sectors as diverse as banking, housing, health, education, hiring, loans, social media, policy. Policy, um, policing, sorry, <clears throat> the military and more. <clears throat> design justice calls for an analysis of how algorithm design, both intentionally and unintentionally, reproduces capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, heteronormativity, ableism, and settler colonialism. So uh, this comes back later, but algorithms, there's a theme in the book of design decisions being made implicitly. And then that kind of acting as a shield um, from critique. And algorithms Ugh. are really good at doing that. Especially ones, I'll add in, that are trained so it's really hard to go back and look and see that, oh, this algorithm actually um, has been told explicitly to, for, to make these decisions uh, that are promoting um, something like the patriarchy or what have you. Um, but they do actually uh, promote. Um, so they work even better to promote uh, or reproduce um, the what would be called the matrix of dominance. Uh, so that, that theme and then turning around and saying, what we need to do is make the decisions explicit uh they go they're at that are they're at ends there it's notoriously difficult to expose um some of these algorithms <clears throat> it's funny because if you look at historically um some of the ways statistical models have been trained and people call machine learning now uh one of one of the ways or one of the problems is communicating or proving or um, really supporting why a system made a decision that it did. And so going back and trying to say what well, was trained with this data and this is why um, that was kind of historically the, the problem and the challenge and then as things got better and better, let's say just facial recognition or something like that, whatever got better and better started being the, let's say, investors or whoever's stakeholders, they started just being you know, like, okay, well, we just trust it because uh, it works, right? So you've got all of these systems out there, some of them working well and some of them not so well, I like say, I mean, do you think your recommendation system for movies on Amazon or Netflix, do you think it works really well? They spent a lot, millions and millions of dollars on it. I don't think it works that well, you know, for me at least. Um, but um, same types of um, systems behind the things that are making these decisions on, you know, uh, recommendations on uh, whether you should get a loan. So uh, there's that and we're going to get 
a little bit more into that in chapter two. Um, any other comments about the values? I would like to say, I mean, the, the name of this chapter, Design Values, but I would reiterate, reiterate, there's power and inequalities, right? So, okay, we, we made that statement. Um, it doesn't say, let's get rid of power inequalities. It just it points out that there are power inequalities, but it doesn't say that. It says historic, you know, there's some communication on historically, we we should have some remediation on in, injustices. We kind of, it's obvious to see that there should be some of those, but um, but saying that is the biggest value that I found was this statement here. The point is not that it's wrong for privilege, but the point is make it explicit. So that's what I got out of this uh, chapter. I mean, I like the quote of the, we should love, and then that will solve things. Well, I'll call that the uh, John Lennon style of decision making. Oh, we need this level. Okay, who, who's got questions here? Carlos. Yeah, I guess more of a comment. This kind of reminds me of um, of uh, Google and uh, their algorithm for uh, fixing um, photographs and pictures that are taken on Android, um, where I guess uh, they've been trying to work on that to try to uh address how like some of their algorithms make assumptions about like a person's kind of skin color and what makes a, a picture look good and so um just kind of like the implicit biases as to what you know what the, you, the, the 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 bias as to like what a person looks like their skin tone and what a good picture would look like is uh, kind of built into the algorithm i think they've actually marketed uh, one of their recent Android releases, or maybe it was a Pixel phone or something, as a uh, be more um, um, just cognizant of like different types of skin tones and things like that. So that's kind of, I just was reminded that about that on, in, uh, uh, in regards to like the last, I think, uh, algorithm section that you were. That's it. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, yep, the algorithm things. I mean, there was a very public uh, Google researcher that left Google um, that I think she quoted in the book, and I'm scared her name, but <clears throat> they did an analysis on the many different algorithms. But one of them, the famous one, is the recommendation for um, sentencing. And uh, so it was essentially, long story short, it was saying, you're Black, you need a longer sentence for prison. And they were able to prove that it was doing that. And so that just blew everything up. Um, you know, a bunch of people, you know, were pointing out some of these algorithms, and it was a big Black eye for all kinds of people, the whole industry, really. Uh, now there's a whole group that all they do is point out. Um, some of the, if we use the language of the book, matrix of domination, uh, biases that are in algorithms. And I um, think it, uh, you know, they, they're, um, they're doing a good job about that, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, I think Jeffrey, who was it? He had something. Oh yeah, I mean, I just was going to say, you know, I think it's pretty clear that there that that the 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 author of this book is taking a stand against oppression, but that it's not just okay to privilege some over others. I mean, you know, in, in within context, that the, the it, um, it we're not all exactly the same, and design decisions will in, invariably favor one group. You know, one one you know 
all we can cut these so many different ways. Like I said, young and old, and you know, um, and so that's that's what that quote that you have in red is drawing attention to. It's n in no way means that exploitation and oppression are cool or okay. Yeah, well, uh, it definitely doesn't mean that. And I don't think, I think the author wants to say what you're saying, but this statement is in the book multiple times. And uh, it's a book about justice, not a book about just design. And then you have something that says, it's not wrong to privilege some over others. It should, I would make this statement there. I would make the statement say something along in some contexts or something like that. Thank that you. Some kind Watson, of thing, some I've been waiting for that. I've been waiting for something like that. I totally agree with you. To me, it sounds like it's it, it, maybe the point is um, making decisions that privilege some is more of a like a tool whenever someone says this is a tool it's not the cause of evil or problems knives guns whatever you want to say we can put anything it's how it's used and which can include technology so technology just in anyone's hands could privilege a whole group over another and it seems like it's the the point would be it can be it's not wrong in and of itself to privilege. It's not immediately <laughs> wrong, but if you take all context, then you can make the final decision. Is it wrong or is it not in that situation? Yeah. And so to, you know, in the author's um, favor, um, to the author's point, I would say they point out that we've already decided that some types of things are wrong and like legally wrong and at least point, you know, the rationale behind the legal structure that's put in place, they're wrong. And since society kind of this, again, I'm being, this is kind of implied, society has said it's wrong, so let's draw on that and in those cases, in those contexts, oh yeah, those would be wrong. We already know you can't, you know, hire someone, you know, you can't discriminate based on all types of protected classes. And so we've, as a society said, it's wrong to do that. And so kind of, it's a no brainer. Uh, I would rather, again, I'd rather, I'd like for it to be strong more uh, rooted in some types of principles along um, saying why. I mean, it's a, it's a just book on justice, so. But it does work, you can say that. There's protected classes, so design uh, justice, obviously you should obey those, the spirit of protecting those classes that have historically been marginalized. Um, but when in other uh, cases, it's not wrong to privilege, as long as you are kind of addressing those protected classes uh, or, you know, marginalized classes and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, there you go. I would, <clears throat> I think I have, I, I would, I would put it differently. I'll leave it at that. So let's go to chapter two, see what we can do here. I will say my favorite chapter, chapter four. Uh, yeah. This chapter about the hackathons and everything, loved it. <laughs> I think we'll make it there today, obviously. But um, okay, so this chapter two, got about 20 minutes. 
question is who gets to do design and how do we move towards a community control of design processes and practices, okay? So this is the, the, um, the first chapter is kind of the why, a little bit of the how. This, this chapter I think is the how, um, the, big, the big thrust of the how. Uh, you know, spoiler, include people in the affected group in the design process. Um, there's ways to do that. So the most invaluable, the most, sorry, valuable ingredient in the design justice is the full inclusion of accountability to and control by people with direct lived experience of the condition designers claim they are trying to change. All uh, right, so let's see. Yeah, I like this saying, nothing about us without us. I think that is succinct. Well, here's something I'm talking about, okay, within a um, corporate entity, we're diverse, so we've handled it, right? So, okay, the critique of that. So, although <clears throat> employee diversity is certainly a laudable goal, it remains comfortably within the discourse of neoliberal multiculturalism and entrepreneurial citizenship. Indeed, there's a growing uh, a managerial literature on the competitive business advantages of employee diversity. Diverse firms and product teams have repeatedly been shown to make better decisions, come up with more competitive products and better understand potential customers. All right, so yeah, structural structural inequality is rarely mentioned within this literature, let alone challenged, because design justice as a framework includes a call to dismantle the matrix of domination and challenge intersectional, uh, intersectional structural inequality. It requires more than recognition that employee diversity increases capitalist profitability. So something inside of this, because something, let's say I'll come at it from a pragmatic critique or a critique of pragmatism, I should say. Because something works doesn't mean you should do it. And that is very counterintuitive to Americans. If something works, obviously you should do it. Well. The, the critique comes into what is it that you consider working, um, working short term, working long term, ethics, these types of things, right? So it kind of begs the question, the whole idea of, oh, the, the sentence, diverse firms and product teams have repeatedly been shown to make better decisions. Just right there, that word better, phrase better decisions, that's kind of a weasel phrase. We squeeze, we beg the question right there. Why is it better? What is better? More profitable? Okay. Yes. Sure. Um, but what we want is, we want it to be, uh, well, within the language of this book, we want to counteract matrix of domination. That would be better. Does it show that they do that? Sometimes, sometimes it reproduces. Sometimes it's a shield to make it to where, oh, well, the committee was diverse. And uh, so now we're blameless. So uh, it isn't the, the design justice framework making things explicit goes beyond saying, oh, 
the process of how we came up with the um the design the design we stop there it also says nope you need to show that you considered all of these other things and she talks about that in uh the scope chapter chapter three um so making your design explicit part of making your design explicit anyone have any comment on that okay Oh, I see Jeffrey's hand is up. Yeah, I, I'm trying to wait, let other folks talk, but I mean, I love this book, mm -hmm. so I have comments on everything. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I agree with you that uh, nothing about us without us is 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 a great, uh, very terse way to capture a really important idea. I mean, I'm, I'm involved in a a collective bargaining campaign in my union now and we talk about the fact that you're either you either have a seat at the table or you're on the menu those are the two and you know as a i'm a big fan of the bolivarian revolution and, and hugo chavez always talked about democracy participatory and protagonist and i think all of this is part of the ethics it relates a lot to the ethics too is that that people should have a voice an active voice in the design of their world Yep, I think so. <clears throat> Anyone else? Get this, this quote here. There's nothing wrong with making things people want. It's just that too little attention is being paid to the things people need. The wants and needs of young, healthy, middle-class people with connections and a reasonable amount of spare cash are overrepresented among, for instance, startup cities priorities. So that is a stance on saying something's overrepresented is, is oh, there's something wrong about that. If there's overrepresentation implied in the statement is that something's wrong. People with money are getting what they want. It's, it's wrong. What, well, how is it wrong? Well, um, kind of, okay, the, my, the smaller minority group that has more power and money, they're getting things that they want. And kind of, of course, if you're in, a, if you're, if you're in some type of system that's um, motivated by the profit motive, then you're gonna serve those groups. And implicit in this statement is, oh, that's wrong. So we have that. Um, yeah, this is something, okay, good. She, what she's saying, what I was saying earlier. Attempting to hope that employee diversity initiatives in the tech sector is successful over time will solve the problem. The first diversifying the uh, technology workforce, as noted above, is a good move, but unfortunately, it will not automatically produce a more diverse default imagined user. Research shows that unless the gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, age, nationality, language, immigration status, and other aspects of user identity are explicitly specified, even diverse design teams tend to default to imagined users who belong to the dominant social group. So that needs to be bolded. So yes. So the point being, make it explicit. And then the rest of the chapter, it's like, okay, include everyone. But you got it. But the make it explicit part is the part I will add in. And, and she says it. Um, some of some of the design techniques can be actually reversed and used to de the phrase she used is depoliticize. So taking out the actual attributes of marginalized groups or whatever it is, and then playing lip service to, okay, we did it, we handled it. So the argument, one of the examples. 
one of the things with the algorithms, one of the things is instead of saying, oh, specifically it promotes uh, prison industrial com uh, complex. And these marginalized groups that are hurt by these um, um, algorithms, that's specifically some, well, the push, the depoliticized version of that is, oh, the algorithm had biases. And so now we, we need to control for biases. And then you can kind of sanitize it, say that you paid a little attention to it, and you're done. Do yeah, it. here, and you're done. It. You have to, you have to point out the actual matrix of domination, specific marginalized groups, all of that stuff. And then you can see the corrections. So it's a, I'm glad that the author is pointing this stuff out because the other um, way that leads to destruction is it makes it more efficient to exploit and say, oh, we got a diverse group. Oh, we, and then now we're blameless. Um, so yeah, um, I'm glad the author not only says that, but says it multiple times. Yeah. Uh, We've got, oh yeah. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Did someone? Here we go with Von Hippel. I'm going to summarize this. So there is a common or a famous, um, and then Taylor, you remember this diffusion of technology graph. You got early adopters, so on and so forth. And you got the, this is, I'm going to summarize a bunch of things. It's kind of a myth of smart people on top created this thing and the hero and it was a few really brave or risk tolerant users started using it and it, it got bigger and bigger and it, and then that's how technology diffuses through it into mass production okay so this person von hippo says and i want to tie this into some other things but says no, 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 no. Lead users, tinkers, people who use whatever it is and then do the feedback, they are responsible for a great deal and maybe even most of innovation. And so that uh, it is a critique of the diffusion model. Now, tie that into the idea of productivity. So we're going to talk about exploitation and design, right? Just summarize some things. Who is it that gets the, who is it that gets the, um, the recognition for who designed and then maybe even any type of like ownership or anything like that from design. Well, it doesn't really mention this. It, it does mention this, but uh, specifically, people have workers, labor has increased in productivity for the past 40 years, 30 years, 40 years, and they've not got a wage increase. One of the pushbacks of that is summarizing smart people on top created the new processes that created that productivity. So labor, just be quiet and receive, be glad you got a job. Don't worry about that the profits go to the top 1%, 3%, whatever, because it's just, the argument is that that's just, and I'm just bringing that up. We're talking about design justice. 
So, no, this Von Hippel saying, no, no, no. The innovation, most of it is done by these lead users. And then also from another book we, we reviewed, uh, a consulting book, one of the ways to solve a problem as a consultant is to go in, interview the stakeholders and the people down at the ground level, and they will have the solution already. After you've interviewed everyone and you find the, the, um, the seed of some type of solution or maybe a fully working solution, you really facilitate bringing that back up to the top. Of course, the people that have the idea, they're not recognized and they for sure aren't rewarded with ownership or anything like that. So that is the exploitation that occurs. And I would say that that's unjust. That's unjust, I should say. So um, she gets into that with talking about the lead users, that this is the argument that you bring people in that are affected or that and she uses the phrase live experience, you bring them in and the one argument is more efficient. Okay, yes more efficient, you, you actually get things that are designed that are, that will be used uh, and, and people will be more satisfied. Okay, but also it's more just if the recognition is given and compensation is given and all that stuff like that. So what is, I try to try to summarize a bunch of stuff, but does anyone have any opinions on any of that? Ultimately, at its best, design justice process is a form of community organizing. Design justice practitioners like community organizers approach the question of who gets to speak for the community from a community asset perspective. This is rooted in the principle of wherever people, uh, that wherever people face challenges, they're all always already working to deal with those challenges, is what I was talking about. Where, wherever a community is oppressed, they are, are always already developing strategies to resist oppression. The principle underpins what Black feminist author Adrian Mary Brown calls emergent strategy. Emergent strategy grounds uh, design justice practitioners commitment to work with community-based organizations that are led by and have strong accountability mechanisms to people from the marginalized communities. So uh, uh, this theme of it's a social process and bringing people in into, it, like I said, it's community organizing and it should look like that. Community accountability. So again, that theme of expanding on the themes of making things explicit. So you make some decisions explicit in a design and the community is accountable. The communities, if you're doing it with the, this process, they need to be accountable. You're accountable. If you get the, she does mention, if you get the recognition for a design, you also need to get the negatives for that design as well. So there's a list of things that can be used for accountability. And I think that's 807. Um, does anybody have any comments? So um, kind of in closing, this is the end of the chapter. 
This is more of like a high level thought and a question for you, um, Watson. In some ways, it, it feels like um, the idea is to build a structure. Go, going back to a comment, I think you were talking, you said something about in, intent uh, was not as important as the, um, the design, I think. I don't, I don't remember the exact words. And the outcome, yeah. The outcome, okay, yeah. So the process and outcome are what was important versus the intent. And uh, the process and outcome should both be uh, fair and moral and all that, of course. And so it reminds me of something that we've talked about with regard to cooperative structure and trying to build in uh, rules. And you could, I guess rules is probably it. Um, for the like legal rules and other things that force a group, company, whatever you want to call it, to act in a moral fair, fair way, even if there's a point where someone that potentially could have power or whatever control might make a decision. Maybe they're feeling greedy, maybe they're desperate, whatever it is, but you have those type of boundaries. Um, we've talked about stuff like all of a sudden, oh, I just made a million dollars. I don't want to share all this. You know, I, I, I want to keep the bigger share than whatever we decided in six months ago or two years ago when we were voting. I want to go against whatever that was. But having those rules and stuff in there, not because we don't want people to think, but we are trying to use them as tools. And it feels like this is kind of along that line, uh, design justice, the process and outcome, putting stuff in place. Yeah, I think so. I think, it, um, so let's say rules, guardrails. One of the guardrails is we got to make it explicit. If I, if I were to want to exploit a group, a community or in a business any something like that and wanted to set up a hierarchy with me on the top i for sure would not want to make the things explicit that i decided i'd want plausible deniability and so making things explicit makes it harder as a guardrail to exploit so i'm i that is the that is it seems like a i mean i don't know how what it seems like to you all at first, it seems like it's not a strong stance, and then it seems like a very strong stance to me. <clears throat> um, because people, like, there's all kinds of things. I want to, I want to have flexibility. I want to. Who knows what we want to do in the future? Let's not put any rules out there. That types of things. There's a saying with Congress: um, they never make laws that make it to where they limit their power um like a a kind of a okay if we don't um use it we lose it kind of situation no 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 they're gonna, no we didn't use it but we gotta we're gonna use it for what we want we're smart we know how to will we we got we got a lot of money we're gonna go ahead and switch over and use it some uh somewhere else kind of thing they don't they don't limit <clears throat> that's what people tend to do so uh yeah, any other final comments? Okay, Jeffrey. Yeah, I just want to thank you again for making this book. I mean, you, it was because of I come here every month that I got to read this book. And this is this is framing questions that are so important for us as social justice IT you know cooperators yeah. maybe considering and so I'm, I'm really psyched about doing this so yeah. thanks 